we're gonna go through some new stuff. So, um, what we're going over today, we just finished with relative dating, which is basically no like exact dates, just placing ranking things in order from oldest to youngest, um, using all the different principles we went over: superposition, oldest stuff on the bottom, youngest stuff on the top, uh, horizontality. The idea that everything, all the sedimentary layers start off horizontal. Um, let's see, lateral continuity. There's all sorts of different uh, uh, principles that we use to try to figure out which is the oldest, which is the youngest. Now we get into absolute dating or better known as radiometric dating because we're using radioactive elements to actually figure out the exact dates. Um, not just a roundabout, this is older, this is younger, um, but specifically how old is this? Um, how many millions of years? How many hundreds of thousands of years? Uh, and so there's there's a couple principles with this and a little bit of math, which isn't too bad, um, but there's a little bit of math involved in this. So uh, let me actually pull this down. Uh, they talk about picking up fossils. How can you tell how old it is? How old it is? Um, it doesn't have a birthday written on its back. Um, and, and that is a difficult part. You can't exactly date fossils. Um, the fossils don't have the material inside them. For you to be able to figure out exactly how old it is um, by doing relative dating you can kind of get a, an age like a range of, of dates um, but you won't know exactly how old it is now if you can date a rock that's near this or in the same layer um, or happens to be somewhat associated with it uh, using radiometric dating now you can kind of narrow this into a very specific time frame and know how old this fossil is so I don't know how good or bad this video is. Uh, we're not watching that one. Let's see. It's only two minutes, so uh, I'm going to pause the video. For those of y'all at home, go to Discovery Education and watch this little two-minute video during our pause. So uh, maybe one day we'll find something radioactive and I can share all that. So um, what? So look, we uh, the way we figure out the exact dates is you have to have a rock that has some sort of radioactive material in it. Um, and actually... More importantly, it's got to be like contained. Hey, put your mask on and wake up. What's wrong with you? Everybody make sure you mask up above your nose. Come on. Uh, so listen, you got to have a radioactive rock. It's got to be self-contained. It can't just be sitting out on the surface of the earth for a long time. Um, that's going to allow the radioactivity to essentially like leak out much faster. Um, if you drill it out from in the ground or you find it within another rock, um, then it can probably be sampled. But you can't just pick... Any old rock, it's got to be a a very good sample to be able to be radiometrically dated. So, uh, they all sit now at one point. Uh, not necessarily. There's plenty of rocks that are underground that have been underground since since they were formed, essentially. Um, but yeah, if it's if it's sedimentary rocks, if we're talking about layers. It, it started out on top, but it quickly got buried, and so uh, you know it's the best we can. And to be fair, there's no radiometric dating where they're like. This is the year. We know the exact year. We give you a range based on how much error we think there is. Um, and you'll note, like, the, the dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago. Next year, 2021, we won't say 65 million in one year. Uh, it's just a generic range. Like, at some point in time, we'll have to change that range. But we don't change it year by year because it's not that exact. Um, so, absolute dating techniques. How are we actually going to figure out uh, what is what is the age of these? How do we use the radioactive elements to do this? Um, so radiometric dating refers to dating a material based on the decay of radioactive elements and what uh, how they they end up kind of turning into other elements. So we cover this in chemistry, where and actually we're covering it in chemistry right now. Uh, we talk about radioactive elements, how they decay, and that's even on the board over here. Your four different types of radioactive decay. Um, you either shoot out alpha particles, beta particles, or positrons. And it's it's the whole idea is to make the nucleus more stable. Um, if I don't have the right number of protons and neutrons, my nucleus is unstable. So it shoots out a little part and hopefully gets down to a point where it's more stable. Um, that takes time, though. And the way radioactive elements work, or the way we kind of understand that they work, um, is there? it's kind of like a random time period. For, for those kind of things to happen. It doesn't happen like clockwork. Uh, it happens randomly. Any second, you might get radioactive decay. Any other second, you might not. Um, and if I had that Geiger counter out, uh, you could kind of hear it go off 
uh, randomly. Sometimes it clicks like four or five times in a second. Sometimes it won't click for two or three minutes at a time. Um, but there's always kind of something going around in the air uh, that, that sets off its uh, radioactive uh, detector. So the way they describe it is radioactive elements spontaneously emit radiation. Um, it's not like a regular thing. It just happens. Uh, it, at some point, the, the nucleus decides, I'm going to try to get better. Uh, hey, wake up. Wake up. I see both y'all sleeping back there. So um, now it's hard to read this stuff. Uh, radiometric dating cannot be applied to sedimentary rocks. It's got to be like an igneous rock. Um, because sedimentary rocks, because there's no way to determine how much of the radioactive material was originally in the rock. And that's what we were kind of talking about earlier. Um, if they've been at the surface pretty much at any point in time, um, they're, they're not going to be viable. Um, you have to have some sort of uh, igneous rock. It could be volcanic ash. We can date volcanic ash layers. Um, so those are at the surface a little bit. Uh, but the pieces inside uh, are kind of self-contained in a way. So let's scroll down and see what else they got about radiometric dating. Uh, they talk about the atoms, the proton, the neutron, and electron. We've already been through this in chemistry, so we're not going to go over it too much. Um, but like I said, it's it's all about the balance between protons and neutrons. Um, if that balance is off, your atom is going to want to change that balance and get back into a stable uh, position. And so that's what creates radioactive elements. Um, they talk about isotopes having the same uh, of the same element having different numbers. Um, carbon dating is one of the more common ones for living things, uh, because carbon 14 is the radioactive version of carbon. We all eat carbon 14 and drink carbon 14 and breathe it in every single day. Um, so we all have like this baseline radiation that's within us. Um, the second you die, you stop eating and drinking carbon 14, um, and your levels start to fall because the carbon's turning into nitrogen. Uh, it's actually over here on the board. We're doing it today. Uh, so your carbon-14 has a bad balance. Um, elements that are small, they want one proton to one neutron. Carbon-14 has six protons and eight neutrons. Um, that's out of balance. So it's, its nucleus is unstable, and at some point in time, randomly, it will shoot out a beta particle, which is a negative charge, and one of these neutrons turns into a proton, which evens up their numbers. Now it has seven protons and seven neutrons. It has seven protons. It's nitrogen. So the carbon in your body actually turns to nitrogen slowly over time. When we come, we come and we find you like in the fields, wherever you died somewhere, uh, if you're an old cave person, uh, we come find you in the fields or in the, the, the iceberg or whatever it is. Um, we, we go into your body and we take a sample and we look at the ratio of how much carbon is left, carbon-14, versus how much nitrogen is left. Um, and we can see that ratio and we can figure out exactly how long ago you died um, because everybody that's living has the same ratio. Um, you have a certain percentage of carbon-14, you have a certain percentage of nitrogen, and it always kind of stays the same um, as long as you're living and breathing and eating and drinking. Uh, and that goes for plants, animals, um, pretty much anything that's alive. Problem is with carbon-14, it radioactively decays pretty quickly. We're talking like tens of thousands of years. I think the max for carbon-14 is maybe in like the 100,000-year range. Um, and so you can't do really, really old stuff, just kind of like human history stuff. Because um, like human history goes back, what, a couple thousand years, a little bit more than that, um, depending on how far back in history you want to go. Uh, but like written history, history certainly isn't like hundreds of thousands of years. So, all right, uh, let's see. Approximately, so carbon-14 is, is mostly pretty rare. Most, 99% of carbon in nature exists as carbon-12. Only about 1% um, is carbon-13. And then carbon-14 exists in trace, trace amounts uh, and is unstable and over thousands of years decays to form an isotope of nitrogen. Um, so that's what we're looking at when we look at carbon-14. For rocks and stuff, um, for, for long-term geologic purposes, we need a different isotope. We need something that lasts a much, much longer time. Um, uranium, uh, plutonium, these things are gonna last for hundreds of millions of years or billions of years. Close the Chromebook. Keep it close. Uh, let's see. 
So they get into the radioactive decay and the spontaneous breakdown. Um, this is basically just one of your atoms changing places. Uh, one of the things we do, and I don't know if we'll do it in this class because I don't have a whole bunch of pennies for all of y'all, um, but you take like 100 pennies, you flip all of them. Like you literally flip them, which is not, it sounds like fun, but you're flipping coins like all class. Uh, you flip all 100 pennies. If it's in heads, you stick it in one pile. If it's in tails, you stick it in another pile. Um, each person that does it is going to get another, like a different number. Um, you're not going to get 50-50 even when you're flipping 100 coins. Um, but at some point in time, you're going to get down to 50 heads and 50 tails. Um, that's what we call a half-life. We've gone over this a little bit uh, before the last test. They, they had a question about it or in the last uh, unit exam. But a half-life is where half of your radioactive element has turned into something else. So if I have 50% carbon-14 and I have 50% nitrogen, that's going to be the half-life of carbon-14. Um, and it's a certain number of years. I don't remember exactly what it is. I think it's like maybe 36,000 years. That's just me guessing, but I think they'll tell us in a little bit. Um, and so if you know the half-life, you can calculate by how much percentage you have left, you can calculate how old that thing is. Um, and that's what we did with uranium on that question. We saw that it had undergone two half-lives. The half-life of uranium was like 1.7 billion years. Um, so you just double that number and it ends up being like 3.1 billion years. Um, I might be a little bit off on my numbers, but not too off. So uh, let's see. There you go. They introduced half-life. Um, they talk about the exponential decay. And basically the way the exponential decay works is it's like an exponential graph. Uh, I'm just going to do a small one here. If you start off here, 100% on top, 0% on bottom. After one half-life, you have 50%, right? Because you've cut everything in half, 50%. After another half-life, you cut that other 50% in half. So what's half of 50%? 25%. So after a second half-life, you go down to 25. What's half of 25? 12.5. What's half of 12.5? 6.25. And it just keeps getting smaller and smaller, but it takes a really long time for it to get down to absolutely nothing. Um, it, it, it almost never happens, which is why they call it exponential. It's going to get like asymptotically closer to zero, but it's not actually going to get to zero. Um, it, it will take like hundreds of millions or billions of years depending on the element to get all the way down to zero. Um, carbon's pretty short, so you know after a couple million years, carbon will probably be all the way down to zero. You won't be able to use it. Um, or there's so little left, it's not going to be trustworthy on the number that you get. Um, so there is a, a kind of a, a, a range to this. But you can see if you cut 6.5 in half, it goes down to like 3.125. Cut that in half, it goes down to one point something. And it just keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller, um, but never really reaches zero uh, until a very long time or it's really close to zero. Um, so that's what they're getting at here with the exponential decay. It's kind of like an exponential graph that curves uh, and just gets closer and closer to zero without e actually reaching it. Uh, know that the half-life remains consistent over time. That's just the way the elements work. Um, it, it's kind of a random decay. So you never know when that equation is going to happen where you spit out the beta particle and one of the atoms of carbon turns into nitrogen. Um, it just happens randomly. But over a long period of time, it sticks to that however many years for half of it to go away. Um, and we just see it over and over again uh, through scientific observation. We don't like make it do that. Uh, that's just kind of how it works out. So I think in a second, hopefully, they're going to start to give us some times. Yes. So, uh, well, now this is the chart that we kind of went through. After one half-life, you have 50%. After two half-lives, you have 25. They go down 12.5 and then 6.5. They do tell you the half-life of uranium is 700 million years. So after one half-life, if you have 50% uranium in your sample and 50% of uh, lead 207, that's what it will turn into. Um, you're going to have 700 million years. If you go into your sample and 25% of it is uranium and 75% is lead, 
then your sample is going to be 1.4 billion years or 1,400 million years. You just double the number. If you have three half-lives, 12.5% and what, 87.5% uh, lead, it's going to be three times that amount. So you just keep multiplying by however many half-lives you have. Um, 700, 1.4 billion, 2.1 billion, uh, and then four half-lives will be 2.8 billion. It helps because we're all familiar with multiplications of seven because of football. Yeah, yeah, so that helps us out a little bit. Uh, so how old will the rock be when you have 93.75% of uranium-235 uh, has become lead? So that 93.75% is going to match up with the 6.25% of the uranium. Uh, it's going to be four half-lives. You'd have 2.8 billion years. So that rock would be 2.8 billion years, which is a pretty old rock. Oh, we're not on a PowerPoint. Uh, let's see. They give you the solution here. And, yeah, we got that. 2,800 million years, which is 2.8 billion years. And I think we're getting close to the end here. Radiometric dating. I think we're good there. Different isotopes and different time scales. Um, so here's the thing. Oh, I was way high on my carbon-14. The half-life of carbon-14 is only 5,000. 730 years um and so you're really not going to be able to get a very long time period for carbon 14 which is why a carbon 14 is only only works for actual living organisms um if you're like a rock or uh i don't know what else you'd be besides the rock um it's not going to work for rocks um living stuff it's going to work for trees animals human beings um trees that human beings have cut down and turned into houses, um, all sorts of stuff like that we can date, but it's gotta be relatively recent or eventually your carbon 14 is gonna run out. Um, so they say about 50,000 years is gonna be your, your limit there for carbon 14. Beyond 50,000 years, you have so little carbon 14 left, um, you could maybe estimate a date, but it's not really gonna be trustworthy. Um, for longer things like geologic timescale stuff, you want to use things that have big half-lives, um, like the 700 million years that it was for uranium. Um, oh, no, no, wait. What was it? Was it, was it plutonium that we used? No, that's uranium-235. Here, uranium-238, so a different isotope of uranium, 4.5 billion years on the half-life. So you can go really far back and date stuff that's very, very old. Uh, that's what you're looking for on the on the old geology stuff. They give you a little chart here, and you might have to use this chart in the assignment tomorrow uh, when we do it. But they have uranium-235 uh, and the half-life, plutonium, uh, uranium, thorium, I don't even know that one, samarium, and then rubidium. Uh, rubidium-87, that's actually not that, uh, that radioactive. I think I've used rubidium and cesium before in, uh, in a lab. So... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's actually how we, we get to the point where we date the Earth. Um, you know, we find really old rocks that, that come from pretty close to the beginning of the Earth cycle. Uh, you know, the first, the very first part in the Hadean, everything was still molten. We didn't have solid rocks. Uh, but once they actually started to form, uh, we can find little bitty pieces of those uh, within other rocks, and we can go in and date them if they have the proper materials inside of them. Um, so... The oldest rocks on Earth were found in Hudson Bay, Quebec, and Canada. Um, and actually today in uh, geology, we saw that the, uh, the oldest part of the United States is kind of up in Canada. Um, out near the Rockies and the West Coast, those are all kind of newer parts that have been added on later. So it's kind of like your, uh, they call it your shoe. Hold on a second. Hello? Yes, yes. Right. She already knows. All right. Have a nice day. So let's see. Uh, I think that's that's pretty much it. They talk about the old uh, the oldest rocks. Um, yeah. So we'll do an assignment tomorrow. I might talk a little bit about the ones tomorrow uh, before we get started. But that's a nice little introduction for everybody. Uh, sorry that. Discovery education is the worst. Let's see. Are there any videos we can watch on here? No, there's not. Yeah, you just wait a second. There might be.
There's a video segment on the components of Adam. We don't need to do that. Keep your Chromebooks closed for just a second. Just a second. Uh, reviewing elements and isotopes. Nah, we don't need that. We have that in chemistry class. Uh, the three kinds of radiation. Uh, alpha, beta, and gamma radiation. Nah, we don't need that. Anyway, I'll decide what we need. I'll decide. Uh, radioactivity and half-life. This is only a minute and 24 seconds. This might have a good, like, visual indicator. It's okay. Uh, in my eighth period class, I don't know why they do it. Uh, I think they think it's hilarious, and I start to tell them not to do it because when I tell y'all not to do things, y'all just want to do it more. Um, but at the end of the day, when they're done, or if I tell them to close their Chromebooks for lecture, they like slam it closed, like as hard as they can. Uh, and it's like, yeah, you're gonna break your Chromebook and have to pay for it, or your parents are gonna have to pay for it. But uh, they do it anyways, like every single day, it's without fail. Uh, so don't don't slam the Chromebook. Sorry. Uh, but then again, I appreciate you because it's better than the people who leave it like half open. So like, I don't want my tabs to go away. Your tabs will still be there when you open it back up. See how old these videos are? My speakers are bad. Zoom in on this dead animal. Like, and then this video, like, Discovery couldn't even have been a thing when that video was created. So why even, like, buy someone's really old video? It's a, a minute and 24 video. You're probably, what, like, a $100 million at least company a year. Uh, you can't make a minute and 24 second video to replace the one that's literally, like, 60. It is. And I, I'm sorry for like complaining about Discovery Education, everybody, but it is uh, literally the worst. Let's see. But Bill, Bill Nye does a lot of stuff, but he doesn't do all the. Uh... He's not a real student. Actually, look, there's Bill Nye. You asked for it, and so now we have to watch it. Oh. Oh. Yeah. You can blame Wes. It's not me. Blame Wes. Blame Wes. <laughs> Let's see what he has to say. Pirates of the Caribbean music. That could be how old was the Earth? The question persisted until 1907, when American chemist Bertram Boltzmann discovered a way to make the rocks and minerals of the Earth provide an answer. Scientists already knew that rocks oh. contained naturally occurring radioactive this. elements, such as uranium. Uh, it's, it's, you know... Uh, we know where the asteroid hit and, like, what happens to asteroids. There's, there's more study on that. It's more physics. It, um, it hit the Yucatan Peninsula, uh, which is down, uh, like, southern Mexico. Um, yeah, and it was, like, half on land, half on water. So it hit, like, right at the, the like, boundary between uh, the Gulf of Mexico and the Yucatan Peninsula. Yeah. What happened the moon? Uh, that's actually, well, that's actually how the moon formed. And we talked about it at the, the, at the beginning of class, uh, before you came back, but you still should have paid attention to it online. Um, that's the Mars sized body, uh, creating the moon. So early, early earth didn't have a moon. Um, or if it did, it's gone now. 
and a, a planet the size of Mars, not Mars, but the size of Mars, hit the Earth. Um, and all the stuff, like, where did it go? A bunch of the stuff, like, actually got ejected out into space. Um, and that debris ended up coalescing into the moon. Um, and so the moon's not going to hit the Earth unless something really terrible happens. But if it did, um, that's big enough, like, probably most of the things on Earth would die. Um, it is so you know, if, a, if an astronaut, not an astronaut, why did I say astronaut? An asteroid, uh, turn the lights on. If an asteroid the size of the dinosaur killing asteroid hit the earth, um, most of us, not most, but a lot of us would probably survive. Um, we'd have a lot of problems and we wouldn't be the same like, uh, race that we are now, but, uh, we, we'd probably survive that. We're pretty, um, we're pretty resilient. That being said, like he said, you put it all in one day and like human history is not even like one second of that day. Um, we're all pretty like comfortable that we're just going to live like as a species. We'll be around forever and like we'll see the end of the earth or whatever. Uh, that's a little bit presumptuous. Um, we haven't been around that long and we haven't faced a lot of uh, adversity just yet. So uh, hopefully we're smart enough to stick around. Do you have another question? Uh, oh, that could be a big problem because the moon has a lot to do with our tides um, and, and what helps keep us kind of aligned uh, with the seasons and stuff. Uh, it could be a real issue and it could also throw off its orbit where either the moon got in a, a um, unstable orbit and either it got shot off on, into space or possibly would eventually come in uh, and hit the Earth if the asteroid is big enough. Um, but you're talking really big planets compared to the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs. Um, the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs would not have been that big um, compared to, like, a planet. So if you're talking mass, you need something really big to hit, like, a moon or, or the Earth to actually change the direction that it's headed. Yeah. All right, everybody have a nice day. Except for Gage. Gage is just sleeping.